Here we are in Houston, Texas with Matt Greenfield and Tiffany Grant in the Whataburger. <laughs> and Matt and Tiffany are both incredible voice actors, ADRs, and uh, I will let you uh, uh, tell, more, uh, tell more information yourself. How about Tiffany? Okay, well, uh, I'm Tiffany Grant. I've been working in the anime industry for about 18 years and uh, working primarily as a voice actor, but also doing uh, a lot of script adaptation work as well over the last several years. And I attend a lot of anime conventions, usually something around 15 or so a year and I really enjoy that and I'm glad to be able to continue working in the industry and it's only possible because of him. I think that means it's to you, Matt. Well, it's not just because of me. There's there's a well. whole industry that's grown up. But, uh, my name is Matt Greenfield, and I was one of the uh, the early people in anime in the U.S. I'm not talking just about the industry. I was actually one of the early fans. I got into anime long before it was a common thing, uh, back when there were only about a thousand fans in the entire U.S. who were into anime. And somehow this strangely mutated over the years to where the opportunity presented itself back in uh, 1992 uh, where I've been talking about how it'd be great for some of the stuff to be brought over other than just the giant robot shows and running a club and someone said hey there's another guy who also uh, has been talking about the same kind of stuff you ought to meet up with him and uh, well, I did. A gentleman's name was John Ledford, and uh, we met, we talked, and ten days later we had a company. Uh, and we're doing this. We've been doing it ever since, uh, which was originally going to be something I thought would be a couple of years of, uh, boy, this will be fun to try. Uh, and it's kept going. Uh, somehow I've ended up, over the course of it, besides producing, I, I write scripts, both original and adapted uh, animation scripts, I direct ADR, I've done some voice acting, uh, pretty much, if you name it, I think I've done it over the last couple of yeah. years, it's crazy, yeah. but uh, I was just, someone was very, very fortunate to, to be wanting to do something at exactly the right place at the right time, which is, I think, kind of the story of everyone in this industry, we all just happen to be there when mm -hmm. the right moment was. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so, uh, do you have any more you'd like to tell about your history? I mean... Most anybody that's going to be watching this will know all. Of it. Will know far more than I could even ask. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, a lot of people ask about, for example, how I got into the business. I mean, how he got into it was he was a big anime nerd, running his fan club, and right. met up with John. But a boom, but a bing, they have a company. Um, about a year and a half after that when they decided they wanted to start dubbing anime. You know, they had been, you know, doing a few subtitled shows. They were going to start uh, dubbing into English. And they put the word out to their friends, hey, we need to find some actors. And one of those people called me and said, these guys have this company and uh, they're importing these Japanese cartoons. I mean, I don't remember exactly what he said. It was, <laughs> it was 18 years ago. But he told me about the auditions and he said, hey, I, you know, I remember that you're an actor and they're looking for actors right now. So, you know, maybe you want to give them a call. And I thought this sounded very exciting. I always had an interest in voice acting, but I didn't really know how to pursue that. Um, I was doing theater, which pretty much pays nothing. Yeah. And I thought this sounded like a very exciting opportunity, so I figured I had nothing to lose, went down and I auditioned and uh, been working in the industry ever since. Very cool. Yeah. And that was the, the very first show that we were working on. Mm -hmm. And we had been thinking about dubbing stuff in English from the beginning, but it started with just subtitles because it was a lot easier uh, to get started. But. I've always had a background in film and television and theater, it's what I majored in, and always felt that a lot of what I was seeing 
being done was not really being taken seriously by the people doing it. You could tell that it was a second gig job. And when we started trying to find someone to dub our titles, we were getting these, this feeling that they're not taking it serious. It's kind of like this, whatever they do would, would not be the best material. So we said, well, let's just go ahead and do it ourselves. So we decided we're going to start from ground zero. And Houston was kind of a strange place to be starting in because our Houston, the Houston theater community was kind of odd at the time. It's never had a huge theater community uh, compared to some cities, but it's all very interconnected. And we felt that the best way to just get the word out was somebody to say, get a couple of actors who are already in the system, get them to start putting out the word, and sure enough, we brought in over the years a lot of really, really good talents. Yeah, just about anybody who lives in Houston, Austin, or Dallas by this point has worked in yeah. the anime industry. Any actor Very cool. in this area, they've all, at least once or twice, they've done some mm -hmm. anime. And, and a huge okay. number of them have left the Houston area and continued oh, yeah. doing it in other areas uh, because we developed a system that I think works very well. Uh, everyone takes it very seriously and when they go elsewhere they drop into these other areas where people are, are doing the same kind of thing we do and people go, wow, these, these people from Houston really have their acts together. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's because we, we do take it very seriously. We were the first company to actually uh, build our own studio and do everything internally. Mm -hmm. Well, at least the first one to do it successfully. Uh, there were a few times before that, I guess. Mm. But uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we just, we've always said, you know, this is this is a true acting job. Mm -hmm. And we've really let the actors dictate how the project works, you know, I think. Yeah. And the fact that they were fans and they took the material seriously. They didn't treat it cartoonishly unless that was appropriate to the, uh, to the project. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, you know, we, we do experiments. Every, every director we brought in, every actor, we're always trying new and different things. I mean, my own personal policy is every show I do, I try something different on every show just to see how it works. We've done some things that people have said are impossible to do, like doing a whole show in lip sync, uh, you know, with huge sections of it actually done live with multiple actors, wow. you, know, you supposedly can't do that, but uh, we've done it. Uh, but I've had the advantage that uh, we've co-produced shows with Japan over the years, so I've gone to see how the Japanese do it, and picked up some of their techniques, uh, and then adapted them to the Western techniques and kind of come up with a hybrid that I think works really, really well. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard that they, you don't do it in groups, but I've never really mm -hmm. uh, seen that it was an impossibility. And yeah. it's, I, it's good to know that it actually gets done. Well, the very first show we ever did, the first she auditioned for, we actually did the whole thing in groups. Mm. <laughs> that was bad. It was really bad. It wasn't it was, bad. The, was result was, well, the result was good, but it was just the reason you don't do it is because if one person makes a mistake, then everyone has to start over yeah. again. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see. Because we were doing it all together mm -hmm. in one room, and the few projects that we've done it on since when we've had several people, each person is in an isolation booth on their own channel, on their own recording channel, so uh, that's fun. That was awesome when we've gotten to do that. It's usually not practical, but on the occasions where we've gotten to do it, it's, it's been really great. Very cool. The fact that there's, there was a myth which we were following, we believed it too, that the Japanese did everything to the video while they were while the show was running, and it was like everyone said, "Well, that's not actually what they do." Uh, having actually seen the Japanese system, it's like, "Oh, okay. What they actually do is they go in and they record very rough dialogue to very rough animation uh, several times, and then in post production they cut together what fits mm -hmm. to make yeah. it kind of work." Uh, but it's it's an interesting process. And once I'd actually seen the Japanese, it was like, ah, that's the, that's the final thing. That's when we really went back into doing group session stuff again. Mm -hmm. Although, gosh, I'm trying to remember. After well, the first show was Guy, mm -hmm. but uh, we did it pretty heavily on a uh, Dirty Pair Flash. Mm -hmm. And Go Danner. And Go Danner later, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, interesting little bit of history. Mm -hmm. um, what do you have going now? Anything you want to plug? Uh, yeah, we're working on a show together. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'm just uh, kind of wrapping that up in post-production yeah, right it's, it's now. Yeah, it's in mix right now. 
Uh, that's uh, Infinite Stratus, which mm -hmm. I'm doing the ADR direction, and uh, she wrote the ADR script. I wrote the scripts for that and uh, play, well, one of the main characters in a few of the little supporting roles in there as well. Uh, that was an interesting project to work on. I thought this show was killing me doing these scripts, and I thought, why is it so hard? It's taking forever. And and he kind of thought the same thing when he was recording, and he's like, man, this show is taking forever to record this. And after we finished the whole thing, he figured out that the reason was because the episodes had insanely high line counts, the highest line count of any show that he's ever really? worked yeah. on. Yeah. And it didn't, somehow it just didn't dawn on me at the time when I was working. I was just like, oh my God, these scripts are taking forever. That's because they just never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> these people are just talking and talking and talking. It's like, oh my God, just, you're in robots. Go fight something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. No, it's too it's angsty. <laughs> the, the funnest part I think about that, that show is the fact that it's, uh, <sighs> it's a huge cast. But there's mm. really only two guys in the entire show. Oh yeah. And one of them is barely in it. I mean Chris uh -huh. Ayers has a has a small secondary character who shows up I think three times over the course of the series and he did his entire part in about thirty seven minutes. Really? For for thirteen episodes. Well, uh, but he's only in two episodes of the show. He's in three. Whatever. <laughs> he's in three. Okay. Uh yeah, but the the main character, mm -hmm. uh you know, he just yeah. really talks all the time. Yeah. Who plays the main character? Uh, Josh Greeley. Josh Greeley. Very cool. Ichika. Mm -hmm. Ichika Orimura. He plays the main character. It's uh, the story is um, kind of in near future, presumably. There are these um, kind of exoskeleton type robot devices that have been developed that for some reason are only able to be piloted by females oh, until really? one day this mm -hmm. young boy discovers that he too can operate one so naturally this he goes This is a great excuse for a show with So he goes off but girls. to the school <laughs> one guy. And one guy. Right, so the <laughs> one guy goes off to the academy which is filled with girls and it's an international cast so you know you've got the the Chinese pilot and the British pilot and the the French pilot and the German pilot and uh Anyway. Very cool. Yeah, it's it's a fun show. It's 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 very silly at times, but it, yeah. it's a it's a fun show. The, the, but the mechs are cool. I have to give them that. The mechs are very cool, and uh, it's based on a series of novels mm -hmm. as well that have not come out in this country. But presumably, oh, really? presumably the novels are popular in Japan. There's yeah, about there's ten, ten of them. Of them. Yeah. Excellent. Which is what's frustrating for us on this show is because there's all these characters from the novels and. For we the can't Japanese really read audience, the novels. They, <laughs> they have to make call outs on all these characters to appear in the novel, so all these characters make tiny appearances, but they are show up in every episode. So you have these characters, it's like, you know, they're in 13 episodes and they've got maybe a total of, oh, 20 lines, uh -huh. but you have to go to every episode and record that character. It's just, uh -huh. uh... <laughs> Yeah. And you wrote the script, Tiffany? Uh, yeah, I wrote the English. Oh, the, the English, okay. Right, the English scripts for it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Painstakingly, but I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, we talk about writing an ADR script, but you don't really write an ADR script when you do write it, but at the same time, yeah. the reason uh, people like Tiffany uh, do so well with it is because you have to act it, because you're, you're looking at video that's already made and trying to match the flap, so you have to act it the way you imagine it will be acted. Right, fit. to fit where all of the, the pauses right. and everything are. So when she's in her office at the house working on a show, you know, it just you just hear in the background all day like her repeating lines over and nah, 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 at the top of yeah. her lungs. Yeah, so I'm, like, I'm you know saying the same line over and over again, except it's slightly different. Like, oh, I needed to add in a word here or take out a word there. Or, oh, wait a minute, there's a little pause right there in that spot, you know, mm -hmm. and figure to see out. What fits. Yeah. Right, to see what fits and, and nuances about like how the structure of the line because something might be referential with the character as far as like they point to something and you have to look at like the way the translator has expressed that that might be true that that is descriptive of what's being said but you might need to rearrange it because the syntax of Japanese and English are very different. Right. 
So for example, maybe the translator has written out something like, we're going to go to that ship over there, but maybe the very first thing you see is the ship. So maybe the line has to become, that ship over there, that's where we're going. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, because it's, it's, so you have to make the, the dialogue, it has to, it still means the same thing, and your, gu your, gu your guide is that translation, but also you have to look at what's happening on the screen. For the subtitles, it doesn't really matter that much, but when you're saying it, and they're showing you something, it's you especially know, when you get or the, like, the, you know, you just hit me in my head. Well, if the, like, again, <laughs> if they start off with, here's my head, it's like, my head, wow, it really hurts. Why did you do that? Or, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Sometimes you have to reword the, what the translator right. just said. Yeah, just the facial expressions, how the facial expressions change. If someone starts smiling in the middle of a line, they should be talking about the thing that's making them smile. Exactly. So it, it becomes very schizophrenic. This is a lot of the stuff that you just, over the years, you just becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But when someone comes in and has never done it before, they're like, I, I don't quite get this. Why is this not playing right? Well, it's because the animation, even though it wasn't right. actually written for lip sync, it was written for a grammatical structure, and you have to kind of look at it backwards. Right, yeah, a lot of it is very backwards. And, and the translator doesn't think about that. The translator is just thinking about the idea of this is the gist of what's being said, which is fine, but if you're going to actually perform this, it has to make sense with what you're seeing on the dialogue. So if there's a key phrase in there that the person, the next person is going to respond to, that has to be at the end. It can't be at the beginning of the sentence because why doesn't the other person respond then? Right. right. The thing that, that, that triggers that response from the person has to be at the correct place, which is probably going to be at the end of the line. So you have to figure out, how do I word this sentence so that thing is at the very end of the line? Right. Uh, the, because the, it does, otherwise it doesn't make sense and won't yeah. play correctly. Yeah, the, ide the ideal ADR script is one that when it's recorded, you can close your eyes and not watch the picture at all and still understand exactly what's going on because the flow is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really um, one of the things that it took us a while to kind of figure out. We started doing groups to kind of get that idea, but eventually realized how to make it work so that every actor, when they're coming in, they're responding to something. Mm -hmm. They're not just doing a line. And mm -hmm. then someone else comes in and does a line. And when you talk about this business, they, they used to call what we do ADR looping, because the way it used to be done is they would take a, a print of the film, they would cut it up into all these little short lengths of film and put them in a projector running in a loop. And it was just one character's line, and it would run over and over and over again, and there was a second piece of magnetic tape exactly the same length that would run in the machine at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it would just keep running over and over again, uh, and then the actors hit there, three, two, one, there'd be countdown, and then line, blah, 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 blah. Three, two, one, line, until they got one that was perfect sync. Uh, and then it's okay, we've got that line. We'll put that over here and we'll start this next line uh, <laughs> with loading everything up again, which is why a lot of the older dubs sounded so mechanical. Uh, right. Because the actors really weren't getting any flow. But one of the things that really benefited us when we started is the idea of an integrated audio video recording system where it was all on a single digital piece of media had just really come in. Um, and we were one of the first companies doing dubbing using that, so we didn't have to worry about any of those technical aspects of the video and the, and the picture having, having to be synced up. We just have the actors work and then slide it back and forth mm -hmm. until it fit. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a lot more natural response. And as we record, every actor hears every actor who's already recorded's dialogue already. Right. So they're responding to the dialogue. Because that used to not be the case. It used to be that you would go in and record and you would never hear any of the other actors' dialogue. And so what typically would happen uh, doing recordings with um, the Houston studios would be that you hear it. If the English actor has recorded, then you hear that, or you would hear the Japanese Just actor. Just to get some kind of feeling. So, but at least you feel like you're responding to a person. You're talking to a person. There's a real person's voice that you're hearing, and right. you know, and you've got the script in front of you, so you know exactly what the exchange of dialogue is. So it's not like you would have to guess if the person hasn't recorded in English. You still know what the other person is is going to be saying because you have the script there in front of you, and you're, you know, watching it right there as you're doing it so it's it's not some like I've worked on a couple times on a video game and typically with that 
you're not uh, there's nothing you're not looking at anything it's just a bunch of lines you're just saying these lines and yeah, they the director will say now say it like you're in pain say it <laughs> right you know, say it like someone stepped on your foot say I it mean like if you have a you know, you know if you have a good director they they might be you know, guiding you through it and telling you sort of what's happening within the context of that video game storyline but you know I've known a lot of people that are just like they just go in and read a bunch of lines and they have no idea what the context of it is it what the context of it is at all, and that's at least something that's really neat about you know, doing doing anime is that you get to watch the finished product. It's all right there. Yeah, very cool. Word of advice to any guys out there: the girl is always right. Just just remember that. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, on that note, I wanted to ask you two: uh, how did you two meet? Well, I almost started telling that story before. Um, it was back on February 12th, 1994. I went down to this audition that I had heard about. And uh, when I went, actually went in to, to do my audition, there was this big scary beardy guy yeah. in there running the audition. And he was very stoic and quiet. And, uh. Anyway, so I did my audition and uh, Afterwards, he said something to me like, yes, well, that was fine, and I'm sure we'll be calling you sometime. Hmm. Have a good day. You know, very <laughs> very reserved like that, very Matt-like, as I now know. Uh, but anyway, that was actually how we met, is I auditioned for him. Yeah. And, and she uh, ended up being the, the lead character, or the lead female character, in the very first show we ever dubbed. Yeah. Guy Awakening of the Devil. Yes, <laughs> boy. Uh, <laughs> over 18 only. Uh, yeah, but so I, I met him, and like I said, he was very reserved and stoic, and I started to go out to my car, and his partner, John, uh, ran out after me, as I recall him, like, flailing his arms <laughs> around. But... Anyway, so however his approach was, John comes uh, out of the studio, and it was raining that day. And uh, he said he started to talk to me. He's like, "Oh, can we can we just get in your car? Because my car was parked right in front of the building." So we got in my car, and he said, "Oh, that was great. We're going to hire you. You're going to be the female lead." And of course, after this, was like, "Oh, that was fine. We're going <laughs> to call you sometime." And then John was like, "Oh, that was great!" Ha -ha. And he was all excited and everything. He told me I was going to play the lead, and that was so. That is actually the story of how I became the very first person. Uh, hired as an anime voice actor in the whole state of Texas. I, I'm the first one. And they had some callback auditions uh, the next day or day or two later, something like that. And they brought back in all these other people to read for a couple of the other parts, and I read with those people. And, um, and then they hired the rest of the cast, and we started recording it within the next few days or so after that. But uh, that was how we met. Yeah, the I, ironic part is it turns out is that we probably would have... You going to go on to that? I think I know what you're going to say. Well, you go ahead and say okay. it. Okay. Uh, this is what happens when you know each other for 18 years. So anyway, <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, I was doing a lot of theater around that time. And uh, probably, I guess about a year or so later, something year, year and a half, whatever, um, I was um, in a play. It was probably a really horrible play, actually. But uh, one day, one evening after rehearsals, a couple of my friends that were in the play with me, they came over to my apartment. And this is the story that you're going to tell, yes. right? Of course it is. Okay. So um, so these two friends of mine, come. They're, they are, they're coming to my house for the first time. And... Uh, they, you know, came into the living room, and um, my friend Todd, who was in the play with me, he glances over and I had a little stack of some anime videotapes there. And very casually, Todd says, oh yeah, that's my brother's company. So somehow <laughs> it never occurred to me that Todd Greenfield could possibly be related to Matt Greenfield. And so it friends, turns out, turns out that here I was working on anime with Matt, and I was friends with Todd. I did several plays with Todd, and I met their parents. And his parents were so good about you know coming to all of Todd's horrible plays, <laughs> and. Uh, 
<laughs> anyway. I should point out these are not my brother's plays. No, he they're just plays that were in. <laughs> yeah, just plays that he was in. Uh, as far as I know, Todd has not written any horrible plays, although someday he, he might. He just acts in horrible yeah, plays. They're not, they're not all horrible, but I'm just saying some of the plays that we did at that time might not have been that great. I'm just saying. It's possible. But anyway, you know, you're young, you need the exposure or whatever. So... Yeah, so that's uh, kind of a funny little story that it turns out that I had actually become uh, good friends with and done several plays with his brother without realizing at all that they were related. I mean, I should point out, they really do not look anything alike. I mean, they only vaguely appear to be from the same species. <laughs> so... <laughs> Other than that, but this, uh, this is the truth of this this industry is it's a very small industry because of what we do, and especially the Houston voice actor community or the actor community in general. It's mm -hmm. funny because she'll pull out pictures from a party that she did like four or five years before we started. It's like, oh well, there's there's pretty much every everyone here is all done voices for AD. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, back in my my early theater days, so many of those people, like I say, well, every actor in Houston pretty much, but just like Kelly Manison and Laura Chapman and uh, Paul Locklear, all these people that I was doing theater with, and you know, later on they ended up all getting involved with, uh, with ADV at some point. Um, yeah, that's just kind of how it works out, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, community that way that you keep finding people that you're kind of related to in some manner. Very cool. Yeah. Yep. I find that with photography. I sometimes look back over the years and go, oh, that's so-and-so. I didn't know I took a picture of them. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't know who they were well, it's, it's really, the, the, the tighter your, your niche, as well as, as an example, is uh, two of the earliest anime companies in the U.S. were Animago and AD Vision. Well, what most people don't know is that one of the partners in Animago is a fellow by the name of Will Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, John Ledford uh, is the co-founder of ADV with me. Uh, what most people don't know is that one of the very first web boards that was ever out there was called Minds of Moria. And really? Roe Adams and John Ledford were the ones who ran that. Very cool. And that was years before. It's like, wait, wait, wait. And <laughs> I had a, a friend I went to, uh, I, I, when I was in college, a friend of mine who uh, was in filmmaking, and we had worked on some independent films together, uh, named Trey Stokes, and I've seen, my path has crossed with Trey's several times over the years. Um, uh, for example, um, it turns out that he was working on the uh, a Godzilla ride uh, and, in Japan, and I was working on a Godzilla film. Uh, really? <laughs> But the weirdest one was that this was about, what, about four years ago, I guess it was, mm -hmm. that uh, George Lucas had that uh, the Lucas uh, Star Wars film fan film contest, and Trey won, I think, the second year with a show called uh, The Return of Pink Five or something like that. Uh, but the person who plays Darth Vader in Trey's Star Wars films is George Manley. Who is a who's a voice actor for us and a, and a friend of ours? Yeah, cool. yeah and it's mm -hmm. just like wait, wait. You know? Yeah, it's 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 a very There's... very small world. You can't get away from each other. No, uh, just a really short little anecdote is uh, my my sister is a preschool teacher, and uh, this is uh, a few years ago when she was a preschool teacher up in the Dallas area, and I had given her some of my Hello Kitty videos. Uh -huh. And she would play those oftentimes at her school. And so one time this lady comes in to pick up her child at the preschool and um, somehow they're talking about the Hello Kitty videos and Naomi said, oh yeah, my sister gave me those. Um, she works in anime, something like that. And the lady says, oh yeah, well my sister works in anime. <laughs> Naomi said, oh yeah, well, I'm not, you know, my sister's a voice actor. And the lady's like, oh, well my sister's a voice actor too. And the funny thing is that I know her sister. Her sister is Carly Mosier. And Carly Mosier and I are both voice actors in Houston and uh -huh. they were in Dallas at the time so not only did they both have sisters who were anime voice actors but we were not anime voice actors who lived in Dallas we were anime voice actors who lived in Houston <laughs> so uh, there are these weird little connections <laughs> very cool. it's, uh -huh. it's very strange I mean the, the one I always like to use well I've got two I like to use. one time I was sitting in a, in a cafe in Tokyo uh, and over the course of three hours, four different people I knew from this 
whole country walked past, none of whom were there for the same reason. Where was that again? It was in Tokyo. In Tokyo. It was in Tokyo. It was just sitting there in Tokyo, minding my own business <laughs> in a cafe. And yeah, not at a convention or anything, but just... Right. Just, these people just wandered past. <laughs> and it's just like, okay, that's strange. The other one I like to pull out is uh, a friend of mine had never heard about the whole six degrees of separation uh -huh. and the whole Kevin Bacon thing. And he was actually dropping me off uh, at the Baltimore, Washington International Airport uh, after... Uh, I was uh, did Otacom one year uh, because he lives in Washington D.C. where I lived for many years, and uh, he had never heard of that. I was explaining this. Well, you know, it's it's the, the whole thing with you know Kevin Bacon. You know, he's like I don't understand. So, well, look, you know, it's like I've never met Kevin Bacon, but I've met and worked with four different people who've worked with Kevin Bacon. So that puts me one degree off of Kevin Bacon, uh -huh. and that makes you two degrees off Kevin Bacon. And he's like, oh, I get it. And, says, and then the guy behind us says, well, no, now you're, actu now you're actually one person off of Kevin Bacon. I was like, what is it? Because mm -hmm. I'm his agent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> the guy could have been playing with us or whatever, but it was just, you know. Who knows? <laughs> it's, That's awesome. <laughs> it's like the world is very, very, very small, and the Internet makes it much mm -hmm. smaller. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you, Matt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going back to when you met, mm -hmm. and you were being uh, quiet and reserved, what were you thinking about this lovely lady who was uh, performing in front of you? I thought she was nuts. You thought she was nuts? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Pardon me. <laughs> and your impression now? She's nuts. <laughs> She has to be nuts. She married me. I, I figured after 18 years, you know, that's probably not changed. Well, the, the biggest the biggest thing is that I honestly think that one of the reasons that we actually coexist on the same planet with each other is because we understand the kind of schedules and demands that our jobs have. Yeah. It's, it's a very strange business. It's a very strange way of living. Um, and I think a lot of people have trouble adjusting to someone who's working in such a, a bizarre pattern because you know you'll, you won't work for three weeks as mm -hmm. an actor and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden you'll work non-stop for three weeks yeah. uh, without a break and then I'm you know I travel to conventions all mm -hmm. the time so mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 not a usual way of, of making a living or a usual sort of industry to be in but I wouldn't pick anything else for sure. It's definitely on the weird side. Yeah, oh, it's for sure. It's definitely on the weird side. <laughs> yeah. And the longer you do it, the more and more it becomes part of you. It's like, mm -hmm. as she will tell you, I have a real weakness for bad puns. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which was only made much worse by the anime industry. Working in the anime industry made it far, far worse. And once she started working in ADR, she realized the same way as everyone in this industry does, the Japanese think the pun is the highest form of humor. And you're always trying to work that back into the into the script. So now she, now she makes horrible puns all the time, too. God. <laughs> Unfortunately. It's just, it's you know, I think most other people just walk out of the room and say, I'm never just looking at you again. <laughs> And in, in, in our mm -hmm. case, it's like, hey, can you help me with this pun? You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Okay, um, I've got a question for you. Um, basically, if there was a question I could ask you that would just give me some an amazing, interesting story, um, what would the answer to be? I don't care about the questions. So <laughs> don't even have to make up a question for me. Well, I have kind of taken a, a different turn in the last few years. Um, acting work slowed down quite a bit a few years ago, and so I kind of, I don't think I was consciously looking, but it just happened that I wanted to find something to help kind of just fill my time or fill some need. And uh, so I work in wildlife rehab now. Really? Uh, yeah. And I've been doing it for about two and a half years now, and I just completely love it. And uh, what another, one of the aspects of that that I do a lot is educational programming, uh, going to uh, nature centers or schools, um, just various places, or sometimes they come to our center, and uh, doing educational presentations, telling people about our uh, native wildlife and uh, how they're protected and what you can do if you find an 
injured animal or an orphaned animal. Um, for example, like the old wives' tale that you, you shouldn't touch the baby animal because its mother's not going to want anymore. That's totally not true. The mothers always want their babies. Mm. And, um, as, and particularly with baby birds, it's so funny because they don't even have a sense of smell. So wh really? how, any, how anybody thinks that the mother is going to smell something? But uh, yeah, so it just I just love doing that. I love working with uh, with wildlife, learning about them, and it's uh, just been really fascinating for me. And I'll definitely continue doing that. Luckily, acting and script writing and stuff has picked up uh, quite a bit more over the past uh, six eight months. But you know, I still gotta still gotta have my career. I got no got to have my critters. So what where where is it you work? What is the place? Um Give I volunteer. Yes, I volunteer with uh, the Wildlife Center of Texas. I know that's a ridiculously long name, the Wildlife <laughs> Center of Texas, but that's what it's called. And um they have a website. I call it the used animal store. It's <laughs> horrible. The he used talks about store. us like pasting the squirrels back together with super glue, which I can promise you we do not do. <laughs> We do not do that. Um, yeah, so the Wildlife Center of Texas, um, we never turn any animals away. Last year we took in over 9,000 animals. Oh, wow. So our goal is, you know, get them better as soon as possible, get them back out into the wild. And uh, it's about, you know, uh, rehabilitating animals, educating people um, about wildlife, helping them to uh, understand how they're an important part of our ecosystem and how to coexist with them and, and things like that. And you know, teaching them that really, for the most part, these animals are not dangerous to us. They're not a threat to us. I mean, we're so much more of a threat to them. But uh, they're uh, a nonprofit organization. It's really kind of an interesting situation of an unfunded mandate because there are all of these state and federal laws where these animals are protected. Right. Like that you can't, you can't uh, keep them as pets. You can't have a pet raccoon or pet skunk or whatever. That's totally illegal. Um, and yet, while there are these federal laws that protect them and you're not supposed to keep them or harm them or whatever, Yet there's no funding to do that. So if, right. if they become, you know, injured in some way or compromised, well, what's going to happen to them? Well, we have licensed rehabilitators have to take care of them, but we get no state or federal funding to do that. So it's huh. all by uh, donations. So you are a licensed rehabilitator? I am not a licensed rehabilitator. Oh, okay. No, but I work under licensed rehabilitators. Um, I don't know if I ever will work up to getting my license. It is a pretty um, intensive process to doing imagine. that. And uh, I am, you know, still interested in maintaining my status as a professional actor and writer. So I'm still pursuing that. But I, it's, it's great to be able to do that. Um, and just as a, a regular volunteer, there's really still a lot of work that, that we can do with the animals. Um, I mean, very few of the people there are actually the licensed rehabilitators. But you do learn a lot. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an on-the-job training, more or less. <laughs> Even more... Than before, I'm amazed at what an amazing woman you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I, I totally love it. I actually started with um, some yellow crowned uh, night herons that were nesting in a pine tree in our backyard. And Kept falling out. they make terrible <laughs> nests. They make really, really terrible nests. And the, the little chicks kept falling out of the nests. And. Uh, Anyway, so that just got me interested in, you know, trying to help them and help all the other neat critters that we have. So do you area. train them to stay in their nests or make better nests? <laughs> no. <laughs> really can't do anything about that, I'm afraid. I think that's evolutionarily long term just so they will work itself out. Yeah, but. they just don't make. I mean, I look at it, it's like, the nest is this big. It's like, have you looked at yourself? You're a heron. You're really large. <laughs> You know, the nest is this big. The babies are like that. It's like, build a bigger nest, you know? You've got five of them and only one can fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she had four. Um, two of them fell out. The other two made it okay. Out of the two that fell out, one of them made it. One of them eh, didn't. But uh, that is nature, as they say. It's uh, kind of the survival of the fittest. That's why like, when, when baby birds hatch, all the eggs don't hatch at one time. They do it in, um, you know, one will hatch like one day, maybe one the next day or every other day or something. And so within one nest, they're not all going to be the same size. They hatch at different times. Huh. And um, a lot of times what happens is, unfortunately, the ones who hatch like, last, the other ones are already a little bit bigger and they can just kind of shove the other ones yeah. out of the nest. So, as um, long as it's a little one that stays in the nest, they're okay. 
uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the littler ones are the ones that kind of end up getting shoved out oh, by the okay. by the bigger ones. But I think the reason that the eggs hatch successively is to give some of them a little bit of a better shot because they all hatched at the same time. I think that would be a non-starter. Plus, the mom, mom and the dad bring them food, I suppose. But very cool. What about you, Matt? Wow, I'm not doing anything that quite that long. Uh, <laughs> I'm... Actually, there was one story I thought that you really ought to tell about our trip to uh, Weta. Oh, to Weta. Oh, yes, yes. Trip to where? To Weta. The uh, Weta workshop in uh, Wellington, oh, okay. New Zealand. The very, very, very cool. famous and uh, Academy Award winning effects yeah. studio. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge, huge special effects buff. That's what I thought I was going to do with my life until I actually worked on a couple of independent films as an effects person and realized that I was much happier telling people what to do than being told what to do. <laughs> uh, but uh, a huge, huge fan growing up of people like Ray Harry Hawson and Jim Danforth and I mean, say, Will O'Brien who did the original effects for the original King Kong. And while we were in... Uh, in New Zealand, we happened to be uh, in Wellington at exactly the right time. They were just wrapping up filming of the new King Kong, um, and we had been talking with Weta about working on a project, so they let us drop by and tour the studio, and right as we were uh, doing the, stu uh, the studio tour, uh, there was this big excitement, and uh, Bob Burns, who's a big film collector, had just come by and actually brought them for the extras reel, the actual original King Kong. Ooh. And I actually got to hold that thing in my hand. The armature. The original King Kong. Yeah. Which is kind of like the film that really got me into the whole animation business. We got to pose it and open his mouth. <laughs> awesome. It was so cool. I mean, I'm not even a, a tenth of the fan of King Kong that he is, but I recognize the <laughs> awesomeness mm -hmm. of that. See, that's actually not the story I was going to tell. Oh, <laughs> no. I just think that's so cool that we got to play with the original King Kong armature. It used to, it had what, monkey fur on it originally? Was it monkey fur dog? Rabbit fur. Ra rabbit fur, okay, I'm sorry, I don't remember what kind of fur. A rabbit fur, but the, all the fur is gone, so it's just a metal armature. And, but uh, as Richard pointed out to us, that if you open its mouth, you can still see him some of the pink paint inside of his mouth. Very cool. That was a very, very cool moment. It's actually not what I was gonna talk about. Oh, though. okay. It's, it's, it, I've, I've been really lucky. I've had a lot of wonderful experiences in my life. And I was going to do one that was completely not related to the film industry at all, except tangentially, mm -hmm. is that what most people don't know is before I got into the anime industry, I worked for uh, the aerospace industry, mm -hmm. uh, and one, really? of the companies that, uh, one of the companies I worked for was Computer Sciences Corporation, uh, which was a, they had a tie-in with Technicolor, uh, and basically working, I did mission support uh, on a number of the, the early space shuttle uh, flights, because wow. uh, I was also a big aerospace geek, and obviously with these eyes, I was never going to be an astronaut back then. Right. Yeah. Who Me knew too. They, who, knew they were, who knew they were going to come up with operations to fix that? Uh, but, so I did that, um, and actually I think probably the, the one that was really the most amazing is I happened to be working uh, in mission support during the original Voyager flybys. Wow. So I was actually one of the very first people to see the first photos coming in from the Voyager flyby. Awesome. Uh, and that was that was truly an amazing moment, seeing this thing that no one had ever seen before raster up on the screen for the first time. That was, uh, like I said, I've been really, really lucky in so many ways in my life. Not the least of which I found a crazy person here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's at least as cool as King Kong. Oh, but I love the King Kong story. Those are both awesome stories. Mm. <laughs> Very cool. Um, now, uh, before uh, before I close, mm -hmm. I'd like to do one more thing. Okay. And if you give me a second, I'm going to shut off the camera for a second. Okay. And uh, I want to see what it says. <laughs> Tiffany, I would like to present to you. The Weird Reviews Female Voice Actor of the Well, ever since I, I, the first time I saw you, I thought you were such an awesome person. I love every <laughs> panel I've seen you in. You're always hilarious. Oh, thank you. And uh, 
uh, I know it's not much, but you know, well, I, it's my very first award. Bronze so. statues, you know. I'd like I to say keep those. it and treasure it forever, but that might not be the best or thing eat to it. do with a cookie. Yeah, probably eat it. <laughs> probably eat it. <laughs> and I had to get a Hello Kitty. You yes, know, that's uh, awesome. That was the first panel I saw you in. <laughs> if you ever get a chance to see this lady on a Hello Kitty panel, she is great. I know a lot about Hello <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love the passion that you have for everything you do, whether it's talking about Hello Kitty or uh, voice acting or the animal recovery. You know, mm -hmm. very awesome. So, anyhow, thank you very much, okay. thank and you, John. thank you, Matt. Uh, and uh, from what what a burger, <laughs> what a burger in Houston, Texas. This is the weird review. <laughs> <laughs>